Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Fair Housing, Current Issues in Bucks County and Beyond. My name is Pam Croak. I'm the CEO of the Bucks County Association of Realtors. And I'm very pleased to tell you today that uh, in recognition of, that April is Fair Housing Month, the BCARD Diversity Committee is so happy to sponsor this very important event. I want to uh, give our real uh, sincere thanks to our diversity co-chairs, Rose Han Yuan and Darlene Meekins for their leadership and guidance of this dynamic group. A few housekeeping details before we get started. Please uh, set your microphone on mute during the presentation. And if you have a question, you can post it in the chat area, which is found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Staff is gonna be monitoring the chat and we'll make sure that our speaker sees your questions. Uh, I don't wanna take a lot of time. So I'm gonna jump right now into introducing our speaker, Carolyn Steinhofer. Carolyn is the Intake Enforcement and Compliance Manager for the Housing Equality Center of Pennsylvania. She has 10 years of fair housing experience, which includes counseling, technical assistance, outreach, education, testing, advocacy, and enforcement. She is a HUD certified housing counselor, and she previously administered the fair housing program for the Lancaster County Human Relations Commission. She was a test coordinator and enforcement coordinator for the fair, I'm sorry, for the Fair Housing Council of Montgomery County and served as code enforcement manager of Norristown, PA. She has spoken for us on many occasions and I thank her for being so generous with her time and also taking the time today to, to talk about such important topics. So I, I want everyone to join me in welcoming Carolyn Steinhofer. Take it away, Carolyn. Hi, thanks everyone. Thanks for the, for the warm welcome. I'm happy to be here today to tell you about some of the, some recent um, got issues in fair housing and, and developments. Um, if you have questions at any time, just put them in the chat section and at the end of each uh, topic session, we'll address questions. So first of all, I want you to have my contact information. I want you to feel free to reach out to me via email or phone call at any time. Uh, you can even call me anonymously, confidentially, if you have questions. My, um, my hope is that if you experience any type of fair housing issue or question that you would call me so I can help walk you through it um, easily. So just a little bit um, about us. We are the oldest fair housing council in the nation. We were established um, in 1956 before any um, of the civil rights laws were passed in the United States. Um, we provide counseling, testing, investigations, and enforcement services to assist victims of housing discrimination. We provide education and, and resources um, to help not only the public, but also housing professionals like yourself about fair housing. So today we're going to talk about assistance animals. Um, the number one area that complaints are filed is um, regarding assistance animals. And this is not only with our agency, but it's also with HUD, so it's national. We're gonna talk about um, using criminal records and real estate related transactions. And then the HUD announcement regarding um, sexual orientation and gender identity. So we'll talk about how assistance animals under state and federal law, uh, fair housing law differ from the ADA. We'll look at the HUD guidance, how to evaluate, excuse me, requests for assistance animals, um, insurance policy restrictions, and the um, Pennsylvania legislation. So just a refresher, Fair Housing Act has these seven protected classes. Disability is one of them. Um, Pennsylvania adds two additional protected classes, age over 40, and users, handlers, and trainers of assistance animals for people with disabilities is a protected class in Pennsylvania. So the Americans with Disabilities Act um, prohibits discrimination in public places, places of public accommodation, like hotels, restaurants, libraries, um, post offices. And the animals that are allowed to go into those public places are highly restricted. They are service dogs. 99% um, of the time they're dogs, um, <clears throat> maybe at less than 1% of the time, it might be a miniature horse that's been trained as a seeing eye horse or mobility support. 
but they're in, these dogs are individually trained to do work or perform a task for a person with a disability. So they're seeing eye dog, they're a seizure detection dog, uh, something like that. But someone has a lot more rights in their own home than they do in a place of public accommodation. So under the federal, uh, state and federal Fair Housing Act, assistance animals uh, don't need to be trained or certified. Um, they just have to serve a disability related need and allow a person with a disability equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. So the definition of assistance animal in housing is really broad. It can include service animals, emotional support animals, therapy animals. It can be any type of animal within reason. It does have to be a typical household pet. So there's no assistance alligators or anything like that that wouldn't fly. Um, there's no certification for assistance animals or emotional support animals. Sometimes you'll see people go online and get online documentation, like an online certificate that they pay for. Um, those are scams. They're not legitimate um, verification that an animal is an, is an emotional support animal. So just to review, uh, disabilities defined really broadly by the Fair Housing Act. It's a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of a person's major life activities. And a major life activity is walking, talking, seeing, hearing, breathing, working. So they have the people with disabilities have the right to request reasonable accommodations, so changes in rules, policies, and procedures. So allowing someone to have an assistance animal, even if there's a no pets policy or um, pet fees and pet deposits are waived for assistance animals. Um, another reasonable accommodation is um, if there's a weight limit, um, making an exception to that weight list limit for an assistance dog. So when, when are these requests reasonable? So they're reasonable if they don't cause an undue financial or administrative burden to the housing provider or cause a uh, change in the housing program, they don't cause damage to others or harm and are technologically possible. So if an animal is disrupting the neighbors like with excessive barking or is aggressive or violent, it no longer ceases to be a reasonable accommodation. It's causing a harm or damage to others. So it's the responsibility of the person with the disability to make this request. It's not the housing provider's um, position to offer or even suggest um, an accommodation, even if they're aware of that need. Um, know that someone can make this request verbally and it needs to be considered. Um, we recommend they're made uh, in writing, um, but someone can also make a request on behalf of someone with a disability. There just has to be a connection between the disability and the need for that accommodation. And they can ask for the accommodation at any time. Um, so sometimes we'll see uh, housing providers, um, uh, real estate management companies create standardized forms for reasonable accommodations, and that is fine. However, they cannot require that a person use that particular form to request an accommodation. They can say, here's a form if you would like to use it, but they can't require the use of it. Um, they have to consider every request, even if the person making the request didn't use that preferred form or procedure. Um, and that form cannot contain invasive questions or be burdensome. Sometimes we see some of these forms that seem to have um, be kind of um, discouraging or, or asking too many invasive questions so that, that can um, be problematic. So what to look out for? You can't ask questions that, um, ask, you can't ask to see someone's medical records or ask, you can't ask about the nature or severity of a disability or about someone's specific diagnosis. You can't ask if a person's able to live independently. Um, so avoid those. If you need to verify that um, an assistance animal is legit, because let's that's, that's, that's face it, let's be honest, this is an area where people will take advantage of to avoid paying pet fees and pet deposits. So you have the right to um, request verification from a medical professional. So here's when you can and can't ask for verification. So if someone's disability is obvious, like they are um, visually impaired and they have a seeing eye dog, then you can't ask for additional documentation. You have to accept that on face value. 
If you can't see their disability, it's not obvious, so it's not known to you, like maybe they have a mental or emotional health disability or diabetes, high blood pressure, seizures, then you can request documentation from a medical professional that this individual does have a disability and that they have a disability related need for that animal. So these verification letters should come on, um, should be required to be on a professional letterhead from a medical health professional. It doesn't necessarily need to be a doctor, it could be a nurse, it could be a psychologist or therapist, but it's not uh, typically those um, emotional support animal form uh, certificates people buy online are not sufficient proof. Um, they need to be seen by um, the letter needs to come from someone who's familiar with the person and their disability and is qualified to treat or diagnose their disability. So you can always contact us if you get kind of questionable requests for assistance animals or questionable documentation. Feel free to contact me and even send me that documentation and we'll take a look at it and let you know what next step you should take. So if someone's asking for something that you think is unreasonable, engage in a di interactive dialogue. Ask if there's another solution. Um, you have an obligation as a housing provider to engage in an interactive dialogue if you feel that what they're asking for is not reasonable. Um, so we already talked about this, about the verifications from housing, uh, from medical professionals. But um, again, they should be familiar with the person, the patient or the client, familiar with their disability and their disability re related need. And again, there's no official certification or registration for emotional support animals. So if someone tells you that their animal is a registered emotional support dog, that, that means nothing. So how do you evaluate a request? So you should ask yourself these questions. Um, does the tenant have a disability that's covered under the fair housing law? Remember, it's a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Do they have a disability? Are they requesting a change in your rule or a landlord's rule or practice? Um, like if there's a no pet rule or, or something to that nature. Is this accommodation necessary for their full use and enjoyment? Does this pose an undue financial or administrative cost on the landlord? And would this accommodation affect a fundamental change in the landlord's business? So if your answer is yes to the first three questions, and no to the last two questions, you should grant that request. Um, I'm gonna link you to um, a document that HUD produced um, last year uh, regarding assistance animals. And it also walks you in more detail through the steps of evaluating an assistance animal request. So some other things to consider. So someone who has an assistance animal, they absolutely are 100% responsible for that animal. If that animal does any damages, they're 100% responsible for paying for those damages. So they have to make sure this animal is, they, they clean up after it, that it has all the proper vaccines. If it's a dog, that it's properly licensed and they're maintaining control of the animal at all times. If they're not doing these things, then it's no longer a reasonable request to have that animal. So what if um, the housing providers insurance policy would terminate or increase in cost by the presence of a certain breed of dog if there's a, a breed restriction. So remember that an accommodation is unreasonable if it imposes an undue financial or administrative burden on the housing provider, but the burden is going to be on the housing provider to show that comparable insurance without that breed restriction is unavailable. So you're going to need to shop around. If an insurance provider has a policy of refusing to shore um, housing that has animals without an exception for assistance animals or without um, making an exception for an assistance animal regarding the breed restriction, that housing provider can be held liable for um, discrimination. The Pennsylvania Assistance and Service Animal Integrity Act passed a couple years ago. And I tell housing providers that it is okay to notify um, individuals who are requesting assistance animals about this law. Let them know that this exists. So the, the, the best thing about this law is that it protects landlords 
or associations from being held liable for injuries caused by a person's assistance animal or service animal, which the landlord has permitted on the property as a reason, reasonable accommodation. So there's some indemnity there. It also makes it a third degree misdemeanor to um, misrepresent an animal as an assistance or service animal to create a false document and you know to pretend an animal is a assistance or service animal when it's not. And that's a third degree misdemeanor. It, um, individuals can be fined up to $1,000. So some common mistakes um, that could be problematic for you or result in a, a fair housing complaint are requiring people to use a form, um, not accepting a verbal request or not accepting their, um, you know, their handwritten or, or uh, emailed request. Just being overly rigid with rules, policies, and procedures. You always have to make exceptions for people with disabilities and uh, not responding timely to requests. So the courts have deemed that a stall, um, stalling or delay in responding to a request for a reasonable accommodation is in fact a denial of that request. So you want to respond in a timely manner. If you don't know the answer, at least respond and say, I received your request. I'll be reviewing this and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, and being sensitive, just being sensitive can go a long way towards avoiding a fair housing complaint. So just to recap, uh, housing providers can't refuse to allow someone with a disability the right to an assistance animal when it's reasonable. They can't um, evict someone because they request an assistance animal. They can't charge fees or deposits. Don't stall or delay in responding to requests. Um, you can't require training or certification for an assistance animal because none exists. And don't inquire about the nature and severity of a person's disability. Um, so HUD, um, this is the, the link for HUD and Department of Justice, uh, their joint statement on reasonable accommodations under the Fair Housing Act. And if you do any type of property management or, you know, you're work, obviously you're, you're realtors and you're working in the housing field, you should um, click on this link, have this PDF on your desktop somewhere so that you can search the PDF um, quickly and easily to find the topic that you um, have a question about. And then, you know, I also recommend that you print it out because it's about 12 pages and just kind of review it. It's a lot to read online, but just, you know, read briefly through it um, so that you know what's in there. It's extremely informative and helpful. So this is the assistance animal guidance that HUD published about a year ago. And it walks you through the steps of if someone's requesting an assistance animal, exactly what steps you could go through. It's almost like a matrix that it walks you through. So that's another one that you should um, download and have saved somewhere. We published this Fair Housing Guide to Reasonable Accommodations and Modifications for Individuals with Disabilities. So feel free um, to access this. If you want a printed copy, I'd be more than happy to send a printed copy out to you. So just a couple exemptions, right, to, um, to the Fair Housing Act that includes um, this issue. So um, two or few um, owner-occupied um, building with four or fewer rental units, that's the federal exemption. But Pennsylvania has more uh, strict exemption. It's two or few units under Pennsylvania law. So that's Mrs. Murphy's exemption. And then the for sale by owner exemption does not, uh, the Pennsylvania State Human Relations Act does not have this exemption. So that doesn't apply in Pennsylvania. So any questions about assistance animals at this point before I go on the criminal records? Um, you do have a couple of questions, Carolyn. Let's mm -hmm. start back. The first one was from Ellen Cassidy. Mm -hmm. um, what if the property is a duplex and the owner lives in the other unit and is highly allergic? This was a question that was posed to Ellen in one of the classes she, she taught. Okay, so sometimes we get um, these issues of competing disability needs and the disability needs of everyone have to be considered and carefully balanced. There's these situations that there's just no easy answer to. A duplex is, does not have the Mrs. Murphy's ex exemption. So a duplex is gonna be considered two separate single family homes. Um, it would be very difficult for someone to uh, to, to say that the animals in the, uh, 
adjacent single family home are going to negatively impact your allergies? Um, I, is there a shared ventilation system? You know, is the, an, the animal going to be going into your home? Um, that's a really tough one. I think that probably the animal is going to have to be allowed. I, it would be up to that other person to really be able to prove that this would be an impossible situation for them. And I, I think I think a duplex situation would be impossible to prove. That's just my opinion. From Gabriella Harris, uh, it's, it's a comment, but I've seen an increment of emotional support animals since the pandemic started. Is everyone else seeing, having this experience? Yeah, a lot of people are getting pandemic puppies. Um, my sister included. I thought she had lost her mind. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, a lot of people are getting animals during the pandemic because they're home, they're working from home, they're under increased stress, they're, you know, have this opportunity, they can't go out, they're bored, they want to get an animal. And as I said before, yeah, this is an area that people do take advantage of, but you have the right to ask for proper medical documentation that this animal is, that the person has a disability and that there is a disability related need for the animal. And, it's, and Scott says, every pet is an emotional support animal. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yep. Um, assistance animals are, are not considered pets. They're considered essential, an essential service to a person with disability. I have a dog who I can't live without. <laughs> um, so are we, am I going to provide notes at the end of the meeting? Yes, you're all going to receive this presentation and the recording of the video. And that's it for those questions right now. Thanks, Carolyn. Sure. All right. So criminal records. So, and it, um, so in 2016, HUD released this guidance on the using um, the application of the Fair Housing Act standards to the use of criminal records by providers of housing and in real estate related transactions. So I'm gonna. Uh, uh, it's a very complicated and complex topic. I'm going to try to break it down for you as simply as I can and give you a little bit of a background. So 100 million adults in the United States have a criminal record. I find that unbelievable. A third of the U.S. population. That just stunned me. So across the United States, African-Americans and Hispanics are arrested, convicted, and incarcerated at rates that are disproportionate to their share of the general population. So consequently, this is kind of the whole premise of this guidance, criminal records-based barriers are likely to have a disproportionate impact on minority home seekers. So for instance, African-Americans represent 12% of the total population of drug users. They represent 38% of those arrested for drug offenses, and they represent 59% of those in state prison for drug offenses. So you can see they are disproportionately affected by our criminal justice system. Let's look at our US population, which is on the left. This is 2014 census data. So 62% of our country is white, 12% um, is African-American or black, 17% Hispanic, 9% other. But on the right-hand side, we look at our US prison population where um, the white prison population is 34%, African-American 36%, and Hispanic 22%. So disproportionate representation. Let's look at the lifetime likelihood of imprisonment. This is from the sentencing project. So um, if you're a white male, you have a likelihood, one in 17 likelihood of going to prison at some point in your life. If you're a black man, you have a likelihood of going to one in three likelihood of going to prison sometime in your life. And Latino men, one in six. If you're a white woman, you have about a one in 111 chance of going to prison sometime in your life. If you're a black woman, it's one in 18 and Latina one in 45. So of these third of the US population has a criminal record, member of 100 million adults, 95% of current inmates in prison are going to be released at some point. So only 5% of inmates are in there for life. So all criminal records aren't the same. So um, there's arrested, 
versus conviction. There's a big distinction between someone who's merely been arrested of a crime versus convicted of a crime. There's levels of crime, severities of crime, a felony, a misdemeanor, a summary offense. So if have you ever gotten a parking ticket or a speeding ticket or not stop at a stop sign or anything? Okay, I did. I um, had a speeding ticket when I was 17 and I couldn't stop bawling my eyes out at the time. It was the end of the world. But that is a summary offense, a, a just a summary offense. Um, a disorderly conduct can be a summary offense, summary offense. And then if, the, if say, um, someone's behaved, you know, got in a fight with their girlfriend, they, um, the police were called, they may be given a disorderly conduct, which would be a summary offense. But if they assaulted that individual, if they got in a fight with someone and assaulted them, you know, there was blows, there was physical fighting, then that might be a misdemeanor level that might, they might be charged with a, a simple assault at the misde misdemeanor level. If they pulled out a knife and stab that individual, they'll probably be charged with a felony offense of aggravated assault. So there's different levels. So we also need to look at the length of time since the conduct um, occurred. Um, I had a gentleman in Bucks County who, he was in his 60s, African-American, uh, a army veteran, 100% um, disabled. He um, had a credit score of a 711 and he, his, his, I believe his total disability payments and income was something like 4,800 a month. So he had sufficient income and credit to rent a one or two bedroom apartment, absolutely. But no one would rent to him and he was living in a hotel. Um, and the reason was that 25 years ago, he had a felony conviction for aggravated assault, 25 years ago. Now, two years ago, he had a summary offense for uh, harassment. This is because he got in a fight with his girlfriend. There was loud. Neighbors called the police. The police said, well, you know, nobody's been hurt. You've behaved very badly. We're going to write you this little ticket. It's a summary offense. Don't do this again. So no one would rent to him. Um, and that was very problematic. We were able to in, uh, write a letter on his behalf to various housing providers challenging their criminal um, record. Um, policies and helping him gain access to housing. So we have to look at the nature of the crime, severity of the crime, and the recency of the crime. So just know that blanket bans that um, say that no matter when the person was convicted um, are not go going to meet, um, not going to prove a substantial, legitimate, non-discriminatory interest, and they're going to violate the Fair Housing Act. So this gentleman who had the aggravated assault 25 years ago, he, he, there was a blanket ban. This, these apartments were saying, well, you have a, anyone with a felony conviction, we will not rent to you. Or anyone with any type of criminal record in the past five years, we will not rent to you, even if it's just a summary offense. So those, are, those policies are gonna violate the Fair Housing Act. Decisions have to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to consider the nature and severity of a conviction and the amount of time that's passed since that criminal conduct occurred. So what's a reasonable look back period? So research has shown that over time, the likelihood that a person with a criminal record will engage in additional criminal conduct decreases until it approximates the likelihood that a person with no criminal record will commit an offense. It's about six to seven years. So if someone's gone six to seven years without reoffending, their, their risk of becoming, doing, um, engaging in criminal behavior is about the same as someone who's never had a criminal record. So we kind of use that, that um, research as reasonable framework for a look back period. So always look at a less discriminatory alternative. So um, it, look at facts and circums surround circumstances surrounding the criminal conduct, the age of the time at which the conduct occurred. The, have they maintained a good tenant history before or after this criminal conduct? Have they um, had re rehabilitation efforts? They have maybe supporting letters from a probation officer or employer. Um, 
and exclude you you can't exclude someone just because they've been arrested and not convicted. So the Supreme Court um, stated that the mere fact that someone's been arrested has little, if any, value in proving that they engaged in that conduct. It just means that someone suspected that that person engaged in criminal conduct and apprehended them, but it's not proof that they engaged in that conduct. So we can't use arrests alone to deny someone housing um, at all. I've um, Occasionally, you know, I have uh, consumers who are denied housing and they'll send me the apartment policy or the management company's criminal records policy. And it'll say on there, like, we will not accept anyone with a felony or anyone with a prior arrest. And that is problematic and they get challenged under the Fair Housing Act. So there's an exemption. So the Fair Housing Act doesn't prohibit um, taking action against a person if that person's been convicted of the illegal manufacture or distribution of a controlled substance. So housing providers will not be held liable if they refuse to rent or provide housing to someone who has been convicted of the illegal manufacture or distribution of a controlled substance, even if that has a discriminatory effect. But there's a limitation. Note that that's for conviction, for manufacture and distribution only. It doesn't include arrest for such offenses, and it doesn't include conviction for possession. So to complicate matters, right, um, there's disability-related criminal behavior that I went to address. So remember that the Fair Housing Act defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, um, includes people with a history of an impairment, people who are being perceived as having an impairment. It includes those recovering from addiction. Current users of illegal drugs are not covered. And of course, you have to make reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities. So what happens if someone has asked for a reasonable accommodation, seeing that their criminal record is directly due to a mental health disability or a previous addiction? If they can demonstrate that they've received treatment or they're on new medication, like for example, um, someone's in an apartment, uh, they have a psychiatric disability, they stop taking their medication and they threaten a neighbor with a baseball bat. That's immediate grounds for eviction, correct? Now they can come back and say, my behavior was disability related. I am now getting increased supervision, increased behavioral therapy, I'm on new medication. My medication is being monitored. This behavior is unlikely to reoccur. Please make a reasonable accommodation and withdraw your notice to quit, withdraw your eviction notice, or, you know, um, I understand I've been rejected for this apartment because of this criminal background. Please make an exception to your application criteria due to my disability. If this ever if you're ever faced with this, feel free to contact us and consult with us. So not only do we, we receive um, funding to, to um, assist individuals who've been victimized by uh, housing discrimination, but we're also funded to provide housing providers with technical assistance. So we're here to help you and make sure that you never have a complaint filed against you, hopefully. So utilize us. Don't, I'm not scary. You can call me or email me anytime. Um, and rem remember that the Fair Housing Act does not require that housing providers rent to anyone who constitutes a direct threat to the health and safety of others, or they risk substantial damage to the property of others. So someone who's been, uh, has a history of arson, obviously, is, presents a substantial risk of damage to, to property. Um, someone um, who has a recent history of violent, destructive, or disruptive behavior, you're not required to rent to. Um, however, just don't deny housing to people with disabilities based on fear, speculation, or stereotypes about a particular disability or stereotypes about disabilities in, in general. Um, there was a housing provider in Montgomery County uh, associated with a mental uh, a, a nonprofit that helps individuals with mental health 
uh, get job training and secure housing and so forth. And a landlord told them on the phone that I don't want to rent to any of your clients because I don't want to rent to people with mental health issues. That's, that's obviously a fair housing act violation. So if someone's going to be denied housing or evicted because they constitute a direct threat to the health and safety of other people or, or property, it has to be based on reliable and objective evidence. There has to be a direct threat assessment that has to occur, which takes into account the nature and severity of the risk of injury, the probability that any injury will occur, and are there any reasonable accommodations that would eliminate this direct threat. So even in cases where tenants do in fact present a direct threat due to their disabilities, those tenants are entitled to a determination whether any reasonable accommodation would mitigate any risk posed by their disability related behavior prior to eviction. So in that example that I gave you before, um, if someone's being evicted because they, you know, they stopped taking their medication and they threatened a neighbor or broke a window or, or what have you, if they're entitled and they've been given a uh, notice to quit or eviction notice, they can come back and ask for a reasonable accommodation and say, hey, that's because of my disability. Please give me another chance. I'm going to make, get these services and so forth in place. Now, and this, uh, they can, they can um, the burden will be on them to lay out an argument as to why this behavior is not going to reoccur again. If the behavior reoccurs, they can be evicted. So in summary about criminal records is um, because of widespread racial and ethnic disparities in our criminal justice system, criminal history based restrictions on access to housing disproportionately burden African Americans and Hispanics. Uh, so the Fair Housing Act does not prohibit you from appropriately considering criminal history information from making housing decisions. However, arbitrary and overly broad criminal history related bans are likely to lack a legally sufficient justification and violate the Fair Housing Act. Um, discriminating against anyone or, you know, uh, refusing housing to give housing to someone who just has a prior arrest or any kind of conviction can't, can't be um, justified either. So your policies, the criminal record policies have to be tailored to serve a substantial, legitimate, non-discriminatory interest. You have to take into account the nature of the crime, the severity of the crime, and the recency of the crime. Um, if your policy or practice excludes individuals with only certain types of convictions, the housing provider will still bear the burden of proving that any discriminatory policy, um, practice, any discriminatory effect of this policy is justified. Um, you have to make these determinations on a case by case basis. And then again, selective use of criminal history based on race, national origin, or other protected characteristics violates the act. So, one of the things that our agency does is we do testing, which is like mystery shopping, and um, which is actually is a it is a most of the time um, when individ individuals will call and say, you know, I think I was denied housing because of um, maybe they think they were denied housing because they have kids, right? Um, and we do testing, we can, we can say, well, no, uh, it, that does not appear to be the case. This housing provider seems very willing to rent to kids. And, and this testing helps to prevent an unwarranted um, housing discrimination complaint from being filed. So it's very, um, has good benefits to housing providers as well. But we've also seen in our testing where if we send two similarly situated individuals, say um, both white men, both with the same income, credit histories, et cetera, to inquire about housing availability. Um, in one case, we had our white male was told, um, we do a, you know, here's an application. There's nothing available right now, but here's an application. Uh, you know, fill it out. Um, we'll be in contact with you. We'll, you know, you pay a $50 fee. We'll check your credit. And, 
then we'll go from there. And our black tester was told there's nothing available right now. You can go online to get our application. And we do a criminal background check. We do a credit check. We do, we look in your criminal history and we have security cameras everywhere around here. So that was very, very different treatment between the two testers with um, selective use of criminal history, even mentioning it as a discouraging factor. So you wanna be careful that everyone's being treated the same and everyone's being, um, uh, you have objective, uniform, non-discriminatory qualification criteria that is uniformly applied. So I wanna to talk to you about a couple cases. So um, Sandcastle Towers, it was Fortune Society versus Sandcastle Towers. Fortune Society was a nonprofit agency that helps people who are reentering society from incarceration. Sandcastle Towers was a large um, apart, high rise apartment complex in New York. And Sandcastle Towers said they would not rent to anyone with a criminal record at all. They had a blanket ban on criminal records. So a lawsuit was brought against them and that settled for $1.1 million. It was a landmark federal civil rights case. And it really established that lawsuits can be brought against private landlords who impose blanket bans on renting apartments to people with criminal records. Also, Sterling Glen Apartments um, is a 300 apartment unit in Chesterfield, Virginia. So there was a, a lawsuit filed against them stating that their criminal background policy was over, overly restrictive. It disproportionately impacted communities of color. And um, the lawsuit sought to change the criminal record policy of Sterling Glen. So their alleged, their policy denied housing to anyone with any type of felony conviction or even anyone with a record. Um, anyone with active status on probation or parole was also denied housing. So the, the positive impact that came out of this Sterling Glen Apartments case is that they developed a model criminal records policy, which can now be used by housing providers all over the country to um, create policies that will comply with the Fair Housing Act and not have an overly discriminatory effect. So the first thing you wanna do is qualify people on factors other than the criminal record first. Qualify them income and credit wise. If they don't qualify with their income and credit, there's no need to do a criminal background check. Um, you can provide a tentative acceptance contingent on a criminal background check. And then um, after receipt of the background check, it, um, determine whether there's a covered criminal background, something with a serious, and we, we can go over what those would be, something that is a serious offense that harm the, that would be a risk to the health and safety of other individuals or property. Um, if there's not, um, accept and provide them with housing. If there is a covered criminal background, like a, a something within the past six or seven years, something that may warrant some concern, offer them in writing the opportunity for an individualized assessment and, can, and give them 14 days. They could, an opportunity to provide, you know, recommendations from employers, case managers, probation officers to show their rehabilitation and recovery efforts, et cetera. Um, that way you have protected yourself by establishing that you've given them the opportunity to, um, uh, explain their mitigating circumstances. You've provided an opportunity for an individualized assessment. If they don't get back to you within 14 days, then they're obviously they're denied. Or if you're not satisfied with it, you could still deny them. So the, the covered crimes, as we say, would be felony criminal convictions within the past five years related to property offenses, arson, so forth, major drug offenses, fraud, you know, um, violent offenses against um, individuals and sex offenses. Um, what would not be covered would be just mere arrests, um, charges without convictions, expunged convictions, any convictions that were reversed on the appeal or vacated, um, pardon if anyone, if, if their conviction was later pardoned, and people who are just on probation or parole. So the individualized assessment, a little more details on that. 
you're looking at the facts and circumstances surrounding the criminal conduct, the age of the person at the time they engaged in that conduct. Have they maintained a good tenant history and employment history before or after? Have they had rehabilitation? Um, you know, anything that that would be um, helpful to understand um, mitigating circumstances. And did this crime arise from their status as a survivor of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, or dating violence? Um, that may be a mitigating factor. Um, was it due to their disability, um, including mental illness? And is there anything else related to their history that creates the potential that this the, that, that the property's current residents, their employees or the property itself will be exposed to a heightened risk of crime? And then was there an error in the criminal record? If someone is saying that they're, they're, the criminal record is, is wrong and they can prove to you it's wrong, then you have to um, consider that as well. So some best practices. Um, don't rely just on an arrest to make an adverse decision. Um, this applies to applicants and current tenants. If a current tenant, um, the decision should be, any decisions should be based on conduct, not just simply their arrest. Um, we recommend that you don't ask about arrests, uh, you know, has, have you ever been arrested on an application? Um, it's not an illegal question, but someone may want to know why you're asking and what's your answer going to be, because you can't deny someone housing just because they've been arrested. Don't use a blanket ban based on any type of conviction. That's just too broad and will possibly draw a civil rights complaint. And don't use an unreasonably long look back period. Um, so, you know, five, five years, five, six, seven years is a reasonable amount of time. Um, and you don't want to have that same look back period for felonies as opposed to a misdemeanor or a summary offense um, because the conduct's different and the severity of the crime is different. Um, don't evict a successful tenant because you discovered a conviction in their record after they've been your tenant for a number of years. Um, don't forget to consider a reasonable accommodation if their tenant or applicant has a disability, but remember it's their responsibility to request the reasonable accommodation. It is not your responsibility to suggest one. And don't forget to offer that individualized assessment. Um, make sure your policy is clear, uh, apply it consistently. Um, distinguish between different types of convictions and how is that related to being a good tenant. Um, train your staff on how to apply the policy. So audits show high levels of unequal treatment based on race to applicants with similar criminal histories. So, um, we were 50% of the time audit testing shows black applicants are treated worse than white applicants with the same criminal background. Um, have a clear policy and practice that allows every applicant who has a criminal background that you intend to reject to be offered that opportunity to make their case for continued tenancy or for uh, admission as a tenant before you reject them. Um, your, the individualized assessments that you need to do, they sh we recommend that they are offered and performed by one person so that the outcomes are consistent and it should be done by someone who's not the original decision maker so that there's a second layer. Okay, any questions about criminal records or criminal history? We do have quite a bit of questions okay. um, from Dana Gray. If the behavior did occur again and another tenant is severely injured, what kind of liability will the landlord face? The landlord does not face liability for the actions of other third of if tenants. Um, you're not responsible if your neighbor um, attacks another neighbor. So the landlord does not hold liability in that circumstance. It's my understanding. Okay, and then um, from Ellen Cassidy. Ellen, you might have to unmute because I'm not sure. I'm gonna read it, but it might not be clear. I might not be reading it correctly. Um, does the landlord have to accept that, accept that violent behavior even though is disability related? No. Okay. 
you got no, interested in. no, yeah. the, the violent behavior, someone cannot, it's not acceptable, right? So an individual who's, who's committed violent behavior can ask for a reasonable accommodation to give them a second chance. But if they continue with that disruptive, destructive behavior, then they can be evicted. You do not have to accept that behavior at all. And that answers the question. Mm, good. Thanks. Um, from Patricia Woodward, how does this affect Megan's laws, Megan's law offenders? So Megan's law offenders, they have their own separate set of rules where they're not allowed to live in certain areas like a close proximity to school and so forth. And that still is, that's, so that's not affected at all. Um, they still have to abide by all the Megan's law rules regarding where they're allowed to live or not live and register. Okay, and then Heidi, sorry, just um, accepting tenants that are just stronger applicants, let's say without criminal record, records, aren't necessarily discriminating against the latter. True. And sex offenders and emotional support animals. Okay, so having a criminal record is not a protected class. So if you have if you have a more qualified applicant who happens to not have a criminal record, you can't be accused of discriminating against the other individual because they do have it. it's 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 a you're always allowed to rent to the higher qualified applicant and having a criminal record is not a protected class. And then there was a question about sex offenders and emotional support animals uh, from Heidi same. I don't question. understand. I don't understand the question. Heidi, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, okay, so I deal with a lot of renters. Um, and so I had a gentleman call me and he said he's, uh, you know, a sex offender. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it ended up, you know, fizzling out. He didn't keep up with my phone calls, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I never had experienced that before. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, I have my own personal feelings, but mm -hmm. I share that. But I mean, how exactly is that process supposed to be handled? Like, am I as an agent allowed to decide that I don't want to work with this person because he's a sex offender for whatever reasons I could have a, you know, personal experience myself where I experienced something like that. And right. I really just don't feel comfortable working with somebody who did that, you know, to I'm anybody. I, I would refer that question back to Pam Croak. What's the, the, the policy for realtors in that situation? <laughs> Happy Is there the any? Uh, wow. I'm a, well, well, here's the thing. I, I think that Carolyn alluded to the Megan's Law statute. I think that, and I, I don't have personal knowledge or legal knowledge of what that statute entails, but I, I think that that's where you would have to hang your hat. And I would say that that uh, if you're if you're uh, you own an apartment or something like that, you should have your legal counsel get involved so that you're prepared for something like that and you're not just shooting from the hip, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean that that would be my advice to anyone who came to me about that. You know, because uh, not just yeah. in the whole purpose of like renting as sure. a landlord, but sure. being an agent myself and somebody calls me up and says that, and you know, well, like, I really, I don't feel comfortable working with somebody who's been convicted of something like that. Right. You know, whether they actually did it, you know, bad relationship, they accused him of it. Next thing you know, they're on it. I have no idea right. how that all goes. Right, but, right. but I mean, own, keep in I mind that- for saying, no, I don't want to work with you. Right. I'm sorry, good luck, you know? Keep in mind that that does fall within the criminal records uh, cases that that Carolyn was talking about, and the, you know the disparate impact and all of that. So it it's not an easy question. It is not an easy question, and uh, I think that uh, you you would have to be careful and make sure that you know you check off all of the boxes that that Carolyn talked about, right? Yeah. Uh, but but certainly, if this is your business and uh, you know, this is something that you, you may come across at some point in time, you already have. Luckily for you, it, it didn't pan into anything that you had to deal with directly. But, you know, I, I think it would be worthwhile to talk to your counsel about having a, having a, 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 not a policy, but a plan of action 
you know, uh, if something like that should arise. And somebody messaged me and said, could they call the PAR hotline? The PAR hotline is not going to give you specific right. legal advice. You know, right. I, they, they would probably tell you the, the broad parameters that we're discussing today. And then they would say, for specifics, you need to get counsel. That's okay. what they would say, you know. Um, That's what I thought, but I just wanted yeah, to check with yeah, you. Yeah, but um, I, I always think, you know, it's, it's best to, to be prepared and uh, have someone that you have a relationship with, a, a, a legal relationship with to, to call in these instances. Um, and remember that, that the, remember that oh. the Fair Housing Act does not require that housing providers provide housing to people with a reliable, if you have reliable right. information, that they have a recent history of violent, right. disruptive, destructive behavior. Right. So um, the I'm next sorry, question was about emotional support animals. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of people who can go online and just fill that paper. I could do it for my dog right now. Mm -hmm. He has no actual yeah, training. Those are, those are scams. They are not legit. Yeah. Okay. So when handling something like that, typically what I normally say is you have to have actual, like a note from a doctor that yes. you need this. And mm -hmm. the dog, is the dog required to have gone through some kind of actual training or have some kind of paperwork supporting that this is not just like obviously okay. printed on the computer? Okay. So the verification can come from a doctor, but it could also come from a nurse or a medical professional like a therapist or a psychologist. It doesn't have to be an MD. It doesn't, um, so, but it has to be on letterhead. It has to be from someone who's familiar with that person with the disability, is qualified to diagnose their disability and their disability related need. Um, so those online certificates are just scams. Yeah, I could go online right now and get a certificate for a rock, right? I mean, it's, they're, they're brilliant scams. Um, and then the second part of your question, what was that the second part? Can you repeat the second part of your question, Heidi? So about the oh, dog. Oh, oh, right, training. Okay. So there's no, um, the dogs don't have to be trained to perform a specific service or do any work, but they do have to be trained in the sense that they have good um, behavior. Um, they can't bark excessively and disrupt other people. They have to be properly vaccinated. They have to be properly licensed, properly vetted. Um, mm -hmm. And the owner is 100% responsible to care for them at all times, clean up after them at all times. If they don't, then it no longer becomes reasonable to allow that animal. But for some people with disabilities, I mean, their animals will be trained, their assistance animals will be trained as post PTSD dogs. Um, I have a number of veterans that I've worked with who, who have PTSD dogs who've gone through, you know, a year of training. Um, and then I have individuals who have um, high blood pressure or um, just depression, and they need their um, assistance animal to help them get out of bed every day. Um, I have a family member who um, suffers from some severe depression and having a dog, um, the dog is not trained to provide any particular service or do any work, but we all know that animals are non-judgmental. They're always happy to see you. They accept you no matter what you look like um, or how you act. Um, they, they love you unconditionally. And that is extremely beneficial to people with um, hidden disabilities, people who might have mental or emotional health disabilities. And um, it, the, having the, the animal, whether it's a dog or a cat or a fish, for example, even as long as it's a regular household pet, might just remind that person, like, I need to get out of bed today. And I need to take my medication because I have to feed this animal. Or um, for my family member's um, situation, it forces him to get out of bed, take the dog for a walk. And now he's meeting people and making friends because the dog's an icebreaker. Um, otherwise, he would be alone in the dark in his bedroom all, all the time, probably. So it's incredibly therapeutic, right? Um, just the fact that it's a 
an animal that he has to care for. Uh, we so, do have some more questions. Okay. I just wanted to, if, if we could just keep going forward, because yep. there's a bunch more from other people, yep. if that's okay. okay. Yep. Um, Sarah Duncan asked, what about restraining orders? What about restraining orders? If someone has a restraining order, right. then, then that per that's that's the law. You have to abide by that. Sarah, do you want to unmute? I'm imagining she means can you deny somebody if they have a restraining order? But uh, Sarah, if you're on and you want to unmute, um, if not, we'll just okay. Let's just keep going. Okay. okay. Um, Sorry, let's see. Um, who is qualified to make the individual assessment? That's from Carol Barocca. Okay. So um, we recommend that it, the person um, who's doing this individualized assessment be the same person that does all the individualized assessments so that your, your decisions are uniform and consistent. Um, we also recommend that it's someone, it, you know, if you have a larger agency, someone who didn't make the initial decision um, so that you have a... Uh, a second look at, at the situation. Um, there's no specific qualification standards for that person. And Someone then, who's familiar with the Fair Housing Act and, and the guidance. And then Jessica Vanell asked, what about telehealth online health professionals? Yes, that's okay. okay. Um, Nydia, um, I was told that you were not allowed to ask for a doctor's note because of the privacy law. Um, you can ask for a, a letter from a mental health professional. You just can't ask about their specific disability or to see medical records. Okay. The letter doesn't have to disclose what their disability is. Uh, okay. Um, and then Ellen, the note has to document the need for the animal, not the nature of the condition, which is what you just said. Um, Okay, and uh, that is it. <laughs> okay, I'll go on to, hold on, where am I? Okay, so the last part, I just have a couple more slides and then we're finished. Um, earlier this year, um, HUD's uh, FHEO office announced that they will be enforcing the Fair Housing Act to prohibit housing discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So um, this came about because, um, well, the, Fair Housing Act sex discrimination provisions are comparable in text and purpose to those of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which bars discrimination in the workplace based on sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, Bostock versus Clayton County, the Supreme Court held that workplace prohibitions on sex discrimination included discrimination because of sexual orientation and gender identity, so that now that legal precedent is being applied to housing. So HUD announced that they will accept and investigate all jurisdictional complaints of sex discrimination, including discrimination because of gender identity and sexual orientation, and they will enforce the Fair Housing Act if they find such discrimination occurred. Um, so jurisdictional complaints so is within um, one year of the date of the incident. So I ask you to please visit our website and get a chance, sign up for our Fair Housing News. We only uh, send out emails once a month. You can report discrimination online anonymously or, or ask for technical assistance. We have, a, we have a lot of really good resources on our website. And then finally, I want you to have my contact information again. I want each one of you to feel free that you can reach out to me after this training anytime, email, phone call. You can even call me anonymously and that's fine. And um, I'll try to help you as best as I can with your questions or issues. Thank you so much, Carolyn. You know, th this has been a, an eye-opening discussion. And as long as we're all uh, open-minded and uh, ready to receive the information and have these discussions, it's such an important thing. Uh, and I encourage everyone to reach out to Carolyn if you're ever in a situation where you have these topics crossing your desk. Uh, also, we will be sending to you the recording of today's uh, today's uh, event, along with the PowerPoint slide deck that Carolyn was kind enough to provide to us. So uh, I, I thank everyone for participating. Keep your eyes on your newsletter and social media for future events like this. And 
Again, Carolyn, thank you so very much. Oh, you're very, very welcome. And if any of you want um, training for your individual um, agencies, mm. feel free to ask and I can provide it for your agency. Thank Great. you, Carolyn. That, that would be sure. awesome.